Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alana. I work for a hedge fund called Two Sigma. So since I work for a finance company, I am required to show you this slide for compliance reasons. In this presentation, I am not trying to sell you anything or provide investment advice. So welcome to my talk. Uh, I'm Alana Hashman. I work as a reliability engineer at Two Sigma on our Kubernetes platform team. And I'm currently a member of the Kubernetes Instrumentation Special Interest Group, or SIG. For the past year, one of my major projects at Two Sigma has been to develop and maintain our monitoring stack for our many on-premise and cloud-based Kubernetes clusters. A large part of that work has been getting a handle on the current state of the Kubernetes monitoring ecosystem, tracking bugs, submitting bug fixes and workarounds, and so on. I'm really excited to be able to share some of the lessons I learned to save you time and frustration and bring you up to date on what's current in Kubernetes observability tested as of release 112. Coming into this talk, I'm going to assume that you are already familiar with the design and basics of running a Kubernetes cluster and that you've heard of Prometheus, a time series based monitoring tool. If you're looking to learn more about how to stand up and operate a Kubernetes cluster, I recommend you attend Liz Frost's workshop tomorrow at 11 a.m. and I will be one of the TAs. So let's jump right in. First, I'll explain what I mean when I talk about observability. And we'll use this as an opportunity to introduce service level objectives, or SLOs, which give us a way to measure what normal means. Then I'll give you an overview of what monitoring looks like in the Kubernetes ecosystem. I'm going to dive into what specific metrics and components are available, how to set those up, and how to use them. And I'll use this to demonstrate a minimal free and open source software monitoring stack for a Kubernetes cluster. Together, this will give us the tools to be able to talk about what operating within normal parameters means. What does normal look like? And hence, I'll show how this contributes to our observability story by using this to debug some common cluster issues using our metrics. So what is observability? Is that just a fancy new name to make monitoring more marketable? Well, let's take a step back. When you're operating a system in production, fundamentally, you have one goal, keeping the users of that system happy. And so when a thing happens that might make your users unhappy, such as the system going offline, or the system returning broken responses, or the system running out of capacity, you probably want to know about that from your own monitoring in advance of your users complaining about it. I'm going to generalize a bit and refer to all of these cases as something gone wrong. When something goes wrong, observability lets you answer the questions of what, where, how, and why. Now, Something gone wrong is going to be a subjective experience from team to team. For a production database backing your entire business intelligence stack, a 24-hour outage on a weekend is probably unacceptable. But if you're offering development databases as a service for engineering prototyping, your users might not even notice a weekend outage. How do you communicate expectations with your users when you want to agree on whether something's gone wrong? Well, perhaps you could set service level objectives. If you're not familiar with service level objectives, I like to think of them as a formal specification of what your team considers normal for a service you operate. A good set of SLOs will document different qualities of your service, such as availability, latency, capacity, with specific targets you intend to maintain. It's important to note that the areas you care about and your target objectives will differ based on circumstances. For example, if your Kubernetes cluster is only supporting development use cases, you'll likely have much less stringent targets than if your cluster needs to support production use cases. You may even have different SLOs for different clusters with segmentation between those use cases. Defining SLOs isn't easy because the end goal is making your users happy, and that's a hard thing to quantify in performance numbers. Hence, it's important to understand your customer use cases and ask empathetic questions to better understand their needs. So to give you a starting point, here are some questions I might suggest thinking about when trying to put together SLOs for a Kubernetes platform. Who are your end users, and how do they interact with your cluster? Are they going to be random developers writing, running kubectl directory, writing YAML files? Or is there a platform team responsible for building tooling on top of your Kubernetes offering? What are your end users' performance expectations? Depending on your answers, this could lead to a vastly different architecture outcome. A platform team interfacing with your end users might mean that control plane outages are less visible. So perhaps you can spend less time working on control plane reliability and performance. 
An intermediary platform might also be able to provide some buffer for excessive client load, so you can worry less about capacity or mitigation strategies for noisy clients. Since you're building a compute platform, I'd also spend a lot of time thinking about overall capacity and load planning. How many nodes do you have available per cluster, and what's their size? If you work with physical data centers like I do, this may be a pretty fixed quantity you need to work with and schedule around. If you're in the cloud, you have a lot more options in the short term and ability to adjust capacity. How many users are you expecting on your platform? Do you have any ideas about their workload sizes? For example, if you're running build workers, they're likely going to have very bursty CPU usage, whereas long running video encoding jobs will likely use a constant large amount of CPU. That's potentially going to affect how you want to schedule and segment workloads to ensure smooth performance for everyone. So now that we're thinking about the use cases and trade offs we're trying to support, let's take a look at what selecting some SLOs might look like in practice, keeping in mind that their main purpose is communicating your team's expectations for your service with your users. Here's some concrete examples we could select for a Kubernetes cluster, broken down by area. For availability, we might tell our users we're aiming for the Kubernetes control plane of a given cluster to have 99% uptime. On a monthly basis, this communicates that you plan on having a little over seven hours of downtime. You might use that time to do maintenance like a major version upgrade of the API servers, or maybe this just reflects your platform isn't mature yet and your users should plan for unexpected downtime. For latency, we might say that we expect a valid pod to start within five seconds in the 99% burst case. This means only 1% of pods would take longer to start over some interval. Of course, an invalid pod would never start, so we shouldn't make any promises about those. For capacity, we might aim to support up to 50 running pods per user in our cluster for some definition of user. Maybe this corresponds to a cluster namespace or to a specific end user that our platform team supports. In order to spec out this number, we might have done some load testing, counted available IPs for cluster networking, and so on, and determined this is what we can accommodate based on our understanding of an average customer and their workload. In another cluster, where workloads are typically more CPU intensive, we might not be able to guarantee that many. So from these examples, you can see there is plenty of flexibility and give and take in declaring your SLOs. When you view them through the lens of setting customer expectations and commitment to quality of service, rather than a measure of your team's ability to deliver nines, I think they are a little less intimidating and a lot more useful. So defining service level objectives is a great way to communicate your expectation of normal to your team and your users, but you can't define an SLO if you have no idea what your quality of service is. Without monitoring in place, it's impossible to complete performance testing because you have no metrics for your performance. Once you have some monitoring in place, you can start running sample workloads, which will give you an idea of bottlenecks, API server load, and so on. Hence, it is critical to include a monitoring stack in every Kubernetes cluster you build as part of its launch, as this will allow you to tune performance and iterate on your SLOs. Collecting metrics on our cluster health and performance is an important part of our overall Kubernetes observability story, because that will enable us to measure our SLOs and provide data that, when things go wrong, we can use to debug what, where, how, and why. But how, you ask? Well, let me show you how it's done. We'll walk through instrumenting Kubernetes as a case study. We're going to need to collect some metrics, but what metrics are even available to use? And once we have those metrics, what can we do with them? How can we analyze, aggregate, and visualize them to learn things about a Kubernetes cluster? Many components in the Kubernetes stack export Prometheus metrics out of the box. Like Kubernetes, Prometheus is a cloud-native computing foundation project. It's a time series based monitoring system that scrapes metrics on an interval from instrumented jobs. Because of Prometheus's widespread support in the Kubernetes ecosystem, it is very likely it will be an important part of your monitoring stack, and hence Prometheus metrics are the focus of this talk. This is what a Prometheus metric looks like. Each time series has a name, a series of labels with values, and an overall value. Uh, in this example, our time series is called up. It has a label job with label value cube API server, a label instance with value API one, and the overall value is one, presumably because our API server is up. Conveniently, most components of the Kubernetes stack export Prometheus metrics by default. You don't have to do any additional setup, you just need to scrape them. For example, 
etcd exports Prometheus metrics, which can be used for monitoring the performance and health of your cluster's database. The API servers export Prometheus metrics, which similarly can be used for monitoring performance and health of each individual API server. The kubelets and C advisor daemons on each Kubernetes node also export Prometheus metrics, which you can access via the API server or directly. These provide information on pod resource utilization, number of running pods per node, and the like. You can also configure Prometheus to use cluster service discovery to monitor service endpoints. This makes it easy to scrape things that run inside your cluster by simply putting an annotation on their Kubernetes YAML. In addition to the out-of-the-box metric sources, there are some additional exporters you can run on your cluster. All of these pro are provided by the Kubernetes project and are available on GitHub. The first is Cube State Metrics, which is a stable project owned by the Kubernetes instrumentation SIG that's sort of like a Prometheus adapter for your current cluster state. It talks to the API server and gathers and derives all sorts of handy Kubernetes-specific information about your cluster. It can tell you about quotas and quota usage, about whether or not nodes are scheduled, and so on. I rely very heavily on Cube State Metrics for our cluster monitoring. The next source is Metrics Server. It's an incubating project that aggregates a minimal set of metrics from kubelets that it then serves programmatically. It's intended to be highly performant and can be used to power autoscalers and kubectl top. If you use the kube up script to deploy your cluster, you get a metric server by default. My team currently does not use metric server as it's not yet stable. Uh, we don't provide uh, support for auto-scaling on our clusters, and we provide interactive Prometheus-based dashboards rather than directing users to run kubectl top. Metric server metrics are not in Prometheus format, although the project is currently working on Prometheus compatibility. The last source I wanted to mention briefly was Heapster, as when I started work on Kubernetes monitoring a year ago, it was still widely supported and recommended. It aimed to address a similar use case as metric server and used InfluxDB storage. Heapster was officially deprecated in April of 2018, so I recommend you avoid using it. Since the Prometheus ecosystem is very rich, there are even more sources of metrics you might be interested in collecting on your clusters by running some of the official Prometheus exporters. One that immediately comes to mind is Node Exporter, which allows you to collect system metrics for your nodes if you don't already have a means of doing so, or you'd prefer to have all of your metrics in one consistent format and place. There's also Black Box Exporter, which allows you to probe arbitrary endpoints for HTTP responses, which you can then use to implement health checks and uptime monitoring. You may also want to take the opportunity to write your own exporter. Our team has, for example, written a Canary client that launches pods with credentials to verify authentication is working properly, and then exports that telemetry in Prometheus format. There are many other supported Prometheus exporters you could run off the shelf, depending on your needs. They're not strictly necessary for a minimal monitoring stack, but they're useful options to have available. From these metric sources, let's take a look at what kinds of information we can get from where. Container performance information, such as CPU, memory, and network utilization, are currently exported by C Advisor. General pod information, such as the pod IP, what node the pod is scheduled on, pod controller type, what image each container is running, number of container restarts, et cetera, are mainly available from Cube state metrics. Node performance info we can get from Node Exporter. This gives us a detailed system view of CPU load, memory usage, networking stats, and the like. General cluster info, such as the number of running pods per kubelet, number of nodes online, number of services, and overall resource utilization is available from a number of different sources, including the kubelets, C advisor data, and cube state metrics. Control plane info is exported by etcd, the API servers, and other control plane components. And metrics available include database and write performance, uptime, request counts, and latencies. For sample queries and reference time series, take a look at the reference code I posted on GitHub. Uh, there's a link in the talk resources section at the end of my slides. So let's put this all together and deploy it. For a minimal Kubernetes monitoring stack, we will need to deploy Prometheus and Cube state metrics. This diagram is not the only way to architect a cluster. But I'm going to use this example since most non-toy clusters will have a multi-master architecture, and it's relatively common for etcd and the API server to run together on master nodes. I'm going to illustrate control plane components in blue and data plane components in green. 
on our masters, we have our etcd replicas, one active, and our three API server replicas. We also have some worker nodes. Each worker node is running a kubelet and a C advisor daemon, and probably some pods, which I decided should look like peas. On each worker, C advisor communicates with the kubelet, and kubelets communicate with an API server. We're going to run our monitoring stack in cluster with a single replica of each component. I'll talk a little bit more about why in the next few slides. In practice, the monitoring components wouldn't all be scheduled on the same node, but I put them there to make drawing this picture easier. Cube state metrics, our first pod here shown on the right, queries the API server and serves its representation of the current cluster state. Prometheus is our second pod on the left. With appropriate configuration, it can scrape all of the out-of-the-box metrics as well as cube state metrics. The red dotted arrows here show some of Prometheus's possible scrape targets. I haven't included anything here about dashboards or alerting because that's outside of the scope of this talk, but we can also deploy our Grafana dashboard in cluster as well as Prometheus's alert manager for alerting. Feel free to ask me about that during Q&A after the talk. So, I enthusiastically suggest you run these components on top of Kubernetes. I know it's scary to run your monitoring stack on top of the platform you want to monitor, but there are some pretty good reasons to do so in this case. First, credential management is way easier. We can grant service accounts granular permissions, and then Kubernetes will deal with all the token rotation and access control. We don't have to worry about provisioning or bootstrapping special credentials in order to authenticate from outside the cluster. This saves us a lot of headache and improves our overall security. Kubernetes also gives us some powerful abstractions that make our lives way easier deploying this stuff. Built-in service discovery means we don't have to hard code scrape targets. Kubernetes deployments means we can always rely on Kubernetes to ensure we have a replica up of our monitoring components, that pods get restarted when they fail, that when a node goes down, pods get rescheduled elsewhere, and so on. This gives us reliable uptime for our monitoring components approximately for free. Also keep in mind that Kubernetes is architected to, in such a way that the data plane should be resilient to control plane failures. In theory, even if we lose all of our API servers, Prometheus should keep working because it's just a container happily running on a machine somewhere. It doesn't need the control plane to keep, be up to keep working. Indeed, I wanted to show you this screenshot for one of our QA clusters because I thought it was great. Uh, this is a graph from Prometheus that shows all the API servers in the QA cluster went down due to a botched certificate rollout. However, the control plane outage did not affect the monitoring system. Prometheus kept running just fine the entire time and was available during the API server outage, which is how I was able to take this screenshot. And it was able to alert us that this happened, so that was pretty cool. So, I'm hoping I've convinced you it's okay to run your Kubernetes monitoring stack on top of Kubernetes. But I also mentioned I think we should only run a single replica of each monitoring component, that we shouldn't bother with a high availability setup, at least initially. Why? This is mainly because the Kubernetes ecosystem's approach to high availability monitoring is immature, and I don't think this is a problem you should have to solve on your own when you first stand up a monitoring stack. Current deployment best practices for a high availability setup for our main monitoring components, Prometheus and KubeState metrics, suggest just run two replicas. Let it be said for the record that high availability deployments are never as simple as just run two replicas. <laughs> Running two Prometheus instances is going to double your scrape load, and on our clusters, Prometheus is already one of our most demanding clients. Having two stateful canonical metric sources is a little weird. Of course, Prometheus metrics aren't intended for perfect accuracy, but I'm also not sure I'd want to round robin between the two, and hot cold load balancing isn't free. Now, cube state metrics, on the other hand, that's stateless, so why not just run two replicas of that? Well, you can't naively load balance those either because that breaks Prometheus counters, which expect to be monotonically increasing. Instead, you could scrape all of them simultaneously, but then you'd have to deduplicate all of the metrics client side, which is a massive pain. Uh, this angry smiley summarizes my feelings on the matter. The good news is there are known issues, uh, and these are known upstream, so I'm hoping we'll be able to improve some of these things as a community soon. If not in Prometheus, then at the Kubernetes layer. But this is okay. 
From an observability standpoint, imperfect monitoring is better than no monitoring at all. There are trade-offs to be made when you architect any stack. And what I like about the starting point is that it gets you pretty good metric coverage for very little initial setup and maintenance work, especially now that you have some of my open source examples to play around with. In any case, how can we address some of the issues we incur by running in cluster in a non-HA configuration? Well, set up some backup monitoring jobs. Do it off cluster so you can isolate yourself from cluster failures and ensure you have coverage for anything you consider absolutely critical. Even with a single replica, Kubernetes scheduling should give us at least 99% uptime for things running in cluster approximately for free, so we don't have to spend any extra engineering effort on that. Hence, a human only needs to intervene if we encounter extended downtime due to a serious failure, like a control plane issue or a bug causing monitoring downtime. The appeal of this setup is avoiding issues with data integrity while not having to do a lot of work. This frees up time you can now spend on platform reliability or building user-facing features if you want. Or maybe you can spend more time on the HA story, whichever best suits your users and your needs. So I'd call this an overall win. Now that we've deployed the stack and we're monitoring our clusters, what can we do with all these metrics? Since we're mostly standardized on Prometheus metrics, we can use the Prometheus query language, PromQL, for metric analysis and aggregation. To prototype and for one-off queries, we can use the Prometheus web UI for visualization. Once we've figured out some stable, useful queries, we can display aggregated data in permanent dashboards. Grafana is an open source dashboard and graph editor that's capable of accepting Prometheus as a data source. It's pretty popular, so you might already be running an instance somewhere. In that case, you could just hook up your Prometheus data source and piggyback off that instance rather than having to spin up a new one for Kubernetes. If you find you need programmatic access to data or you need to perform arbitrary queries, you can also fetch metrics in JSON format. This is supported by both Prometheus and the metrics server. And metrics server even supports gRPC. So let's try putting these metrics we're collecting to work. I'm going to walk you through three examples of actual use cases where we had a problem in production, and I use these metrics in order to debug it. And for bonus points, in each case, I'll cover both an obvious means of debugging and the less obvious one. This minimal monitoring stack we've set up might not get us perfect observability, but it will help us figure out where things went wrong. And if you get familiar with the metrics you're collecting and you learn from QL, you'll be able to form hypotheses and test them as you debug your production issues, too. Okay. So first problem, a node has gone offline. I frequently see this come up because a user complains they have a pod in an unknown state, which usually means the node it was scheduled on went offline. But if possible, I want to know in advance that a node has gone down so I can anticipate user questions when I'm on support. How might we detect this, given the metrics we have available? Well, here's an obvious solution. Look for all the nodes that Prometheus failed to scrape. Here, we can use Prometheus's built-in uptime series that indicates whether or not a scrape target is up. One means it's online, hence this query matches everything that's offline. And now that this is something we can easily detect and we can also access Prometheus programmatically, we could add some automation to check for nodes in this state for some period of time and then automatically reboot them or perform maintenance so a human doesn't have to intervene or really think about this at all. Now, frequently, things don't fail in quite such a tidy way. In production, I'll usually encounter gray failures rather than outright outages, in which a bunch of users complain their pods aren't working quite right. And we do some investigation, and we find out all the affected pods happen to be scheduled on a particular node. So we can isolate that as a likely source of the problem, but the node hasn't gone offline, so we're not quite sure what's wrong with it. Poking around at some of the Prometheus metrics, I noticed that commonly when a kubelet is in a gray failure state and is acting kind of slow, it's slow for everything, not just for pods and users. So this shows up in our Prometheus scrape duration data. In this case, we can detect such problems by looking at unusually high scrape times. Typically, it takes under a second to scrape data for a node. So if a node metrics endpoint is regularly taking more than two seconds to respond, there's probably something a little off. So this query can help flag nodes that are not behaving optimally. At Two Sigma, we run multi-tenant clusters. So a frequent problem we run into is customers complaining they can't launch pods. And in the vast majority of use cases, this is due to a customer hitting their namespace quota limit. Now, we could determine this by querying kubectl for quota data, but there are also corresponding Prometheus metrics for this data, generated by kube state metrics. So let's query for customers at risk of hitting their quota limit. 
In this expression, I'm calculating the percentage a customer has used of their CPU quota. The first line sums across all of the pods in the namespace foo, uh, and then we divide that by the hard CPU resource limit for the namespace. If utilization is over 95%, it's likely that the customer has run into a quota issue. So this happens pretty often, and customers usually ask us in response, please increase our quota. However, this query only accounts for request usage. It doesn't have any knowledge of the actual container resource utilization. So if we instead use metrics from C Advisor for utilization, checking the namespace's actual CPU utilization compared to their limit, we might find they've simply over-provisioned their workloads. Here, let's say that if the actual usage is under 35%, we consider the containers to be over-provisioned. We make a lot of this data available via a quota metrics dashboard that all of our customers can access. This can help them understand their quota, capacity, and utilization, and assist them in right-sizing their workloads. This means they don't have to wait on my team to understand their use case when they can't schedule a pod or iterate on their resource requests, and then we don't have to field as many inquiries about pods not launching. It's a win-win for everyone. So here's our last fun problem. For a period of time, we had a lot of customers complaining to us that API server access was slow both via kubectl and via like, HTTP API calls. Now, the API server collects metrics for this, so I figured I'd dig into that to see if there's any wisdom I might gain. Perhaps a particular verb was slow, like post or patch, and maybe that would indicate some issue with write performance on our API servers. This query allows us to plot out HTTP call latencies for our API server for the P99 grouped by HTTP verb. So let's take a look at that and see if there's anything particularly slow. Here is that query plotted in Grafana representing P99 latencies of our API servers by HTTP verb over a 24-hour period. Uh, the green line is a marker for five seconds, and the graph has a linear scale. Over on the left, we see that latency of something, a post maybe, spikes well over five seconds. Uh, and now the numbers are a little bit small, but I'll read them to you. You may notice something a little fishy about this data. First off, for most of the verbs, the current HTTP latency clusters around just below 125 milliseconds. That's both kind of slow for an HTTP call and also a really weird number. And the second thing you may notice is the maximum recorded HTTP call latency is exactly eight seconds. Again, kind of a weird number. So I dug into this and things got even weirder because I noticed the histogram metrics didn't match the summary metrics that were being exported by the API servers within orders of magnitude sometimes. And it turns out that the default API server histogram metrics in Kubernetes are total nonsense because the min and max bucket sizes are 125 milliseconds and eight seconds. Uh, I actually dug into the code at some point to confirm this and here is that code with a fix to add better bucketing. Uh, between 50 milliseconds and 60 seconds. 60 seconds is the default API server timeout on an HTTP call, so I suggested that as a more reasonable upper limit. I thought they were gonna make the lower limit five milliseconds, but apparently not. Anyways, the good news is that this is going to land in Kubernetes 1.14 as part of an over upcoming metrics overhaul I've been working on. So. While this query didn't help us pinpoint the source of our API server slowness, which turned out to be an issue with our journal deconfigs, it did help us confirm that things were slow, since eight seconds is pretty long for an HTTP call. And we were also able to confirm this problem and suggest improvements upstream. So that's the end of my talk. I hope you learned some cool things. Just to recap what we've covered, we learned about observability, how to select SLOs, and how monitoring is an important part of both. We explored some FOSS monitoring solutions for Kubernetes. We built out a minimal monitoring stack, and then we were able to use it to debug some production issues. If you want to try out some of this for yourself, I've posted a bunch of sample code and YAML files on GitHub for you to be able to spin up your own version of this minimal monitoring stack and test out some Prometheus queries of your own. There's also a workshop tomorrow at 2 p.m. being taught by Kevin Crawley if you want to learn more about setting up Prometheus on Kubernetes, as well as tracing, which I did not cover in this talk. Thanks to my employer for letting me attend on their behalf, and thanks to these folks for reviewing my talk. This is the aforementioned link, which I also posted on Twitter. Do we have time for questions? Uh, we, we don't have time for questions. No time for actually, questions. But uh, it is the end of the day, and we have time for happy hour, which is about to begin.
So perhaps if you're open to answer. See you for questions at happy hour. Thanks for coming to my talk.